These girls in Malta are playing a special kind of hopscotch. The nine compartments stand for the nine months of pregnancy, with the last bulging compartment representing the mother's pregnant belly. In fact, the local name for this game, Il Pashu, means passion or suffering, reminding the girls of the pangs of childbirth. The maternal burden is greater for the human species than for any other animal on Earth. One of the greatest differences between the human male and the human female lies in the unequal distribution of parental duties. I'm not referring to the vex question of who gets up in the middle of the night to calm a crying baby, but to something so basic that we tend to take it for granted. I'm referring to the primeval topic of the ownership of the womb. In earlier tribal societies, giving birth was usually looked upon as a rather simple procedure, made easier by the presence of experienced female relatives. Here, in one of the surviving tribal societies of New Guinea, this mother-to-be is comforted by her own mother. In contrast to the West, where giving birth is seen as a medical condition requiring hospital treatment, here it's treated as a more natural process. The woman doesn't lie on her back like a hospital patient, but uses a more appropriate squatting position, which allows gravity to play its part, as the baby is quickly and easily delivered. With this mother, fuss is kept to a minimum, and she deals with her newborn in a remarkably matter-of-fact way. But for Western women, this moment is usually surrounded by anxiety and tension that converts a natural biological act into a social drama. Having survived this culturally heightened drama, the mother has, in many countries, been faced with the additional burden of being considered unclean. In many places, even today, she's traditionally confined to bed for 40 days. During this time, her female relatives help care for the baby and do the housework, and her husband is kept well away to avoid any sexual contact. The church, which views giving birth as an animalistic act, wishes the new mother to be kept at arm's length until she can be cleansed. She's not allowed to touch food or to cook during this 40-day period. Her relatives must do it for her. The ending of this confinement is marked by a special religious ceremony. Here, the new mother is attending her church to be purified. This ritual marks her re-entry into society, and traditionally, it was the first time she was allowed to leave her house. She must stand there meekly and accept what is, in truth, a masculine insult delivered by a male priest who asks his male god to wash the dirt from her body and soul now that the 40 days are over. In this way, the church reaffirms its view of male superiority and adds yet another unnecessary burden to the female condition of motherhood. Social attitudes interfere with natural mothering in many different ways. One of the most widespread is the preference for baby boys over baby girls. In parts of Estonia, on their wedding day, couples perform a special ceremony to encourage the future birth of a child of the sex they prefer. The groom must risk life and limb by climbing a special tree to tie a coloured ribbon to one of its topmost branches. A blue ribbon for a boy, a pink one for a girl. <laughs> Tradition has it that the higher he climbs, the more likely it is that the couple's wish will be fulfilled. 
In many countries, the bias towards male babies is the result of the fact that a boy will inherit the family name and continue the family tradition. <laughs> Traditionally, the symbolism of dressing girls in pink and boys in blue reflected this greater value placed on male offspring. The color blue was seen as the color of heaven and was therefore thought to be capable of repelling the evil forces that were inevitably attracted to the baby boy. Because the male babies were so precious, they needed all the protection they could get. Girls, more concerned in later life with bodily functions such as menstruating, giving birth and lactating, were given the contrasting pink color of their body's flesh. Sometimes, this color code is not immediately obvious. I hardly noticed it in the playground of this Egyptian school. But once the chaotic play period was over, and the sexes separated into their formal groups, I realized that it was indeed operating here as well. The difference was that, although the older boys were all dressed in blue, the girls had been given an Earth Mother beige in place of the more usual flesh pink. When the preference for male children is expressed like this, it causes no problem. But if the underlying message is expressed more strongly, it quickly becomes dangerous. In India, the desire to have a boy leads some mothers to abandon baby girls outside orphanages like this one. There's even an empty cot waiting there to receive them. The weight of the baby in the cot triggers an alarm which alerts staff who hurry to rescue it. All these baby girls were abandoned in this way. In India, there's an added reason why boys are preferred. If a couple have a baby girl, when she eventually marries, they'll have to pay a dowry to the groom's family. These diaries are often such a burden that they can ruin the bride's family. These infants are the lucky ones. Some mothers are forced to see their female babies murdered. Female infanticide is still practiced even today. In China, too, the preference for boys over girls is so great that it puts unnatural demands on young mothers. Their maternal instincts tell them to care for their babies, of whichever sex. But social pressures prevent this, and baby girls often suffer the consequences. Here, the state also interferes with natural mothering in another way. To control the growing population, each couple may have only one child. Here, in this Chinese factory, Female workers must get permission to have a child. When they become pregnant, a flag is added to the expecting row. In return for a couple's promise to have only one offspring, the child will be entitled to great benefits throughout its life, such as free education, priority for a university place and for a job. If all the women in the factory obey the one-child rule, it becomes a model factory, and they're all given extra bonuses. If a couple have a girl, they're often tempted to ignore the rules and try again for a son. But the factories carry out checks to ensure the women are not cheating in this way. Women who slip through the net and get pregnant are given an injection which will kill the baby. So the young mother, whose one aim is to love and care for her baby, all too often finds herself assailed by social pressures. The church may brand her as unclean. If she has a daughter, the baby girl may be unwanted, or she may be forced to have only one child. On top of all this, she may face another major dilemma. For many mothers, the need to work and the need to care for their young creates an intense conflict. 
In the modern world, it's not easy to do both at once. Something has to give, either the mother's earning ability or the fulfillment of her maternal love. For some women, when they set off to work, there's the problem of what to do with the children. They have to leave them behind and rely on someone else to care for them. These Indian mothers are forced by economic necessity to go out to work. If they don't, their families will starve. So these women must entrust the care of their children to a creche, which, in this case, is run by a voluntary organisation. The parents have little or no control over the hour-by-hour -hour experiences of these children or of what they might be learning. They must trust in the second-hand carers and hope that the days their children spend away from them will be as free from harm as possible. In the West, too, mothers must entrust the care of their infants to institutions such as workplace nurseries. This mother is dropping her little son off on the way to work. He'll get used to spending around eight hours a day with the nursery teachers who, no matter how efficient they may be, are not the child's passionately devoted mother. In Japan, working mothers must also seek similar solutions often at considerable cost. These children will spend even longer every day away from their mothers. Again, the working mother is missing vital playing time with her child as she sits staring at her office computer screen. For many British women, work is both a source of income and self-fulfillment. 50% of mothers who have children under the age of five to some form of paid work. The debate about whether nursery care is good or bad for the child is hotly contested. One controversial study maintained that children in full-time daycare tend to have poorer educational performance and inferior language skills than children reared by their mothers at home. The report claimed that they also have more behavioral problems and are more aggressive. Other studies, however, claim that all this depends very much on the nursery, the mother, and the children's background. At last, after a long day, mother and child are reunited. As they set off for home, the modern female must make the difficult switch from being a tough career woman to being a tender mother. Here in Colombia, where poverty and large families go hand in hand, the harassed mother finds a different kind of solution to the maternal dilemma. Unable to pay for professional helpers, she enlists her older daughters to care for her younger ones and act as little mothers. At an age when small girls in the West are playing with toy babies in the shape of dolls, these Colombian girls are already taking on the heavy responsibility of caring for real ones. Sometimes, instead of enlisting younger family members, mothers go to the other extreme and turn to the older ones. Here in the Middle East, 
a mother has left her baby with her mother. The granny solution has the advantage of being both cost-free and reliable. At least the care is someone the mother knows intimately and can trust totally. And older women have a few tricks up their sleeve for calming a baby at bedtime. Here in Greece, a working mother also uses the granny solution, handing over the care of her children to the older generation as she sets off for work. But the moment of separation between mother and child can sometimes be agonizingly unhappy. It's not always like that. If the infant is younger and the granny is skilled at holding its attention, it may not be upset at all when its mother leaves for work. Where families have not been broken up by modern lifestyles, the granny solution is probably the best way out of the maternal dilemma. In fact, the granny's ability to care for her grandchildren is probably the evolutionary reason why women live longer than men. With granny to help, this young mother is able to work happily in her village, confident that her child is in reliable hands. Here in the Polynesian islands of the South Pacific, there's a simple way in which children are cared for by the community. If the mother has to go and work on another island, then her neighbors will take over the task of rearing her young ones. There are no formalities, no adoption papers, no legal proceedings, just an abundance of loving and caring that's typical of a small, stress-free community like this one. Here in the Philippines, many mothers must face the ultimate dilemma. In order to support their young ones, they must leave them not for a couple of hours, but for a couple of years by going to seek work abroad in Singapore. The parting is heart-wrenching and totally unnatural, but the mother has little choice. In Singapore, these Filipino women must market their mothering skills in order to get jobs as maids. My name is Dolores Lomang. I am 36 years old. I came from a province of Mindanao and a single. At present, I'm working in Singapore as a domestic helper. Do you know that what is your post in Singapore? Uh, what is your, your duty? To be work hard. Uh, to work to hard. follow all the rules of our employer. On. The videos are watched in agencies like this one, where wealthy mothers come to seek Filipino maids to look after their children. In this case, one mother's dilemma is another mother's solution, and we're left with the unhappy situation in which neither the Filipino mother nor the Singaporean mother end up caring for their own children. Experienced at dealing with their own offspring, the Filipino maids quickly strike up easy friendships with the children of their future employers. As the women set out on their marathon task of raising enough money to send home to feed and clothe their own families. Easy, way to go, man. Way to make a mess. You guys move your cup. Another totally different solution is employed by these women in Utah in the United States. They're not sisters or friends, but co-wives, all married to the same man. Some of them lead busy professional lives, while others are happy to stay at home and care for the shared children. This female division of labor provides an apparently ideal solution to the maternal dilemma. It enables a mother to undertake a career 
and at the same time to ensure the best possible care for her it's children. 25 minutes after 4 o'clock here at Crystal and Classic Radio. I'm Lindy here with you until 6 o'clock this evening, ha, whether you like it or not. While she's at work, she can be confident that her children are in good hands. Frog Marina is 68 degrees. This is the palace of the Fon of Mancon in Cameroon in West Africa. The Fon also relies on a female division of labor to ensure that his many children are well cared for. He has more than 80 wives and over a hundred children. It's impolite to ask him exactly how many. And the women divide up into working groups. Some like these toil in the fields, carefully watched over by their lord and master. It's hard work, but they concentrate single-mindedly on their tasks, secure in the knowledge that their children are being well looked after by other wives. Another team is preparing the food for the palace tables, again working together as an organized group. Still others cook and serve it. It's usually the older wives who are given the responsibility of looking after the infants, while the younger wives are carrying out the heavier duties. It's an almost feudal system, with the Fon ruling his fondom as an undisputed overlord, so lofty in his status that no one ever dares to shake hands with him. Food for the children is laid out in a long row. A lesser male must drink from his cupped hands because he's too lowly to touch the Fon's drinking horn. When the Fon's children come home from school, a school where even the teachers are older children of his, there's always plenty of food waiting. It's an efficient enough system, even if it does seem to lack something in terms of family closeness or personal intimacy. Bend your knees just a little. Try to keep your knees bent. Okay, let's just say contraction begins and you're already walking down the hallway and you're going to stop, okay? Contraction begins. Cleansing breath. Another solution to the maternal dilemma is to involve the father to a greater extent. This is the paternal solution. And here, in a modern American hospital, fathers are helping to prepare their pregnant wives for childbirth. Pushing in right here. Especially if we talked about your baby's sunny side up or you have back labor. This really is helpful, okay? So sometimes you just, moms want you to push in, just to give a little counter pressure. So he can do that. So uh, either standing or... Standing. In the West, husbands have started to put in an appearance in the delivery room. Indeed, in some countries, it's now considered to be rather insulting, rather offhand, if they're not there. Oh! But with no biological role to play, many fathers, like this one, feel completely helpless as they watch their wives preparing to give birth. Oh, you carry on. Oh. I told you I would from day one. Oh, she wants you to have the next baby, she told me. We have no more. Oh, this is it, huh? Uh-uh. It's argued that the presence of the male during delivery helps to forge a powerful bond between the father and his baby. But it's not that simple. The presence or absence of the father must depend on whether he'll help to calm her down or will add additional stress because he himself is so agitated. It's better than the pain. If he can assist by making her feel less anxious, then his presence will be invaluable. If not, then it's best if he disappears as quickly as possible. In some countries, fathers are playing an increasingly important role in rearing their children. These fathers in the United States represent a new trend in paternal care. 
All of these men have wives who are so dedicated to their careers that the couples have switched roles, with the men staying at home while the women go out to work. Inevitably, there's a social stigma attached to the idea of a stay-at-home father. And to give one another moral support, these men have clubbed together and formed an organisation called Dad to Dad. This has enabled them to meet up with one another and compare the special problems faced by the modern house husband. Clearly, this new paternal solution to the maternal dilemma can be of great help where social attitudes are sympathetic or where male egos are strong enough to ignore any snide remarks. But it has to be admitted that no matter how loving the human male may be, during the early months of the child's life, he's biologically less well equipped than his mate. His biggest failing, of course, is that he can't breastfeed his baby. So he misses out on the intense, intimate bonding that this creates both for the parent and for the infant. Until now, that is. In the United States, a new invention, the baby bonder, gives fathers a much closer sensation of breastfeeding. Two breast-shaped milk containers are worn on the front of his body at feeding time. For the baby, this works well enough, but there remains the question of whether this novel device will make the father feel too foolish for it to do its job of increasing parental intimacy. You want to try to burp her? It's worth asking why some husbands are so embarrassed at the idea of wearing a baby bonder when, after all, they have a pair of biological nipples on their chest. The answer, of course, is that male nipples are sexual, not paternal. They've survived evolution because they're such an important erogenous zone. Like female nipples, they become erect during the course of lovemaking and provide a sensitive area when the actions become intense. An objection has been raised to all the non-maternal solutions to the maternal dilemma. It's been argued that since evolution has molded mothers to care for their own offspring, other carers will never be able to match what they have to offer. During the course of evolution, the human female has been fine-tuned to her baby's needs. She's not even aware of some of her abilities. They're inborn and automatic. For example, within 30 minutes of birth, if she keeps the baby with her against her body, she can identify later on her own baby just by its personal fragrance. And it'd be interesting to test this ability to see whether these mothers are able to do this as well. We don't know whether it'll work, but if they're blindfolded, can they spot which baby is theirs? The mother who thought the baby was hers was asked to raise her hand. And she guessed right. We repeated the experiment, and somewhat to their surprise, every mother was able to identify her own child. We then did the same experiment with the fathers. This time, nobody raised their hand. Overall, the father's success rate was only 50%, indicating that they're less finely tuned than their wives. 
might be, but then because I thought I'd smelled him already, I didn't think you'd do it again. Oh. This fine tuning of the human female appears early in life. If a free choice of a range of toys is offered to a mixed group of five-year-old girls and boys, it's interesting to observe their preferences. Children, today, you're going to look at the toys on the table, look at them carefully, and when you find something that you'd like to play with, then choose that toy and take it back to where you're standing. Look really carefully. Despite the fact that at home the parents of these children had deliberately not influenced their choice of toys, all the girls in this experiment chose female playthings such as dolls or objects associated with nurturing. The boys, on the other hand, chose male objects such as trucks, firemen's outfits, or in one case, a truncheon, which was immediately put to good use. By the way, the teacher was asked not to intervene during this experiment. So even at this tender age, and even without any parental encouragement, the girls revealed strong mothering tendencies. And as they sat there with their chosen toys, the girls were quieter and more composed, as if programmed for their future role as carers. The early appearance of maternal urges can be observed all over the world. Here in Mexico, tiny girls are doing their best to express the caring side of their personalities, mimicking their mothers with varying degrees of success. The maternal feelings of girls are so strong that they extend beyond human boundaries to encompass the young of other species. Any small animal that needs care and protection will arouse strong reactions. The way these British girls are playing with their pet rabbits and kittens leaves little doubt about this. The postures they use, the way they hold the animals, is so reminiscent of the way in which, later in life, they will hold their babies when they become young mothers. Of course, boys enjoy playing with pet animals too. It's not an all or none difference between the sexes. But it's certainly true that girls are generally more tender, more caring and more patient than boys in these quiet, affectionate moments. The mother's fine tuning with her infant faces a special challenge if it's born prematurely. The delicacy of these tiny beings is such that special medical procedures have to be followed, and these can drive a wedge between the mother and her baby. <laughs> All she wants is to scoop it up in her arms. But there are clearly risks if she does this. So, what's the answer? We're all familiar with that picture of the tiny premature baby shut away in a little glass box in an incubator where it can have all the special life support systems that it needs. But recently, here at the famous Kaiser Hospital in San Francisco, they've been developing and pioneering a new method of caring for such babies. 
They call it kangaroo care. What happens is that even with the tiny premature babies, the little ones are allowed out to have skin-to-skin -skin contact with their mothers for quite a few hours every day. And the discovery is that those babies that are allowed that contact develop and grow much faster and leave hospital sooner than ones that are not given that intimacy. The trick is to balance the technical needs that the premature baby requires with the intimacy that is so beneficial to both it and its mother. Just as mothers are fine-tuned to their babies, so the babies themselves become fine-tuned to their mothers. And so it follows that the very best of all the possible solutions to the maternal dilemma is the one that involves the mother herself. The simplest solution, of course, is the one that allows the mother to keep her baby with her as she works. This was possible in primeval times, and even today, where simple agricultural tasks are involved. Even in urban societies, a few mothers still follow this age-old pattern, with babies finding themselves in the most unlikely surroundings. Right, with a cardboard coffin, you, you can have either a wooden burial or you can have a traditional funeral, which is, you know, the hearse, the cardboard coffin and a crematorium, if you wanted. Can I take the name of the deceased, please? Yes. And your address, please? Contrary to rumours put about by traditional male chauvinists, it's a biological fact that women have evolved a high level of intelligence and ambition. Karen Brady is employed as the managing director of Birmingham City Football Club and is in charge of the day-to-day -day running of what many people would see as an exclusively masculine domain. In fact, at 27, she's the youngest managing director of any public limited company in the United Kingdom. Women like Karen don't want to choose between having children or having a career. They want it all. They want to enjoy the full expression of both their wombs and their wisdom. But this isn't an easy trick to pull off. She must develop a dual personality and somehow organize a double life. Even on this big match day, Karen breaks all the rules of business etiquette and brings her much-loved infant with her to the workplace. We have 60,000 fans coming to the test. Well, apart from the fact that we're going to get him 25. <laughs> At half time, she breaks an even more sacred taboo. She feeds her baby in the boardroom. She's all too aware that it's only her high status in the organization that enables her to do this while also being taken seriously as a tough businesswoman. This is a dilemma that the businessman doesn't have to face. For many mothers, the best solution is to stay at home with the children, to be a housewife, to be a traditional earth mother. To 
some, this seems to be the most obvious solution of all. And it works well enough for the woman who wants to breed and who's prepared to give up everything else and concentrate exclusively on rearing her children. With a large family, this can more than fill her day, and providing she doesn't have other ambitions, can be a wonderfully fulfilling existence. In many parts of the Middle East, the expectation that girls, when they grow up, will become baby machines and stay at home is reflected in attitudes towards education. Few girls accompany their brothers to school because their role in life will be to breed and to care for their young, so educating them is thought to be inappropriate and unnecessary. In Yemen, for instance, nearly eight out of ten women are illiterate. Worldwide, almost twice as many women as men are unable to read or write. At this village school, no more than 50 of the 450 pupils are female. Only the lucky girls in this part of the world get the chance to attend classes and obtain the information that might give them the opportunities to acquire a few more adult freedoms. Most girls are kept at home, where they learn domestic skills from their female relatives by helping with the household chores. For them, adult life will offer few alternatives, few surprises. The domestic cycle will continue, much as it has done for thousands of years. In stark contrast, here in northern England, girls at this school are being actively discouraged from breeding. For many in today's overpopulated modern world, non-breeding is certainly one solution, if a rather drastic one, to the maternal dilemma. I brought Chris Holmes in to meet you all, and she's brought these three dolls with her, which are computerised baby dolls. We brought them in to give you a real picture of what it's like to have a baby in the home. And as you can hear, having a baby and looking after it full time is not as easy as it looks. As you can hear, it's already started crying. The only way we can actually stop it crying is to put a probe in its back. You don't feed it like you would a real baby with a bottle. Put this probe into its back. And then you have to hold it still. Now, if it's due for a feed, you probably have to hold that in for half an hour. So if it cries in the night, you're going to have to sit there holding that for about 40 minutes, half an hour. And if you take it out or you start nodding off going to sleep, it'll start crying again. Because you've got to hold it in quite firmly. And also, in its computer, which if I pull it apart, it will tell us how you've actually coped parenting this doll. It'll give us a reading. And the first reading will tell us whether you've actually abused it in any way. That means shake it, drop it, be rough it, hit it in any way. The next button will tell us whether you've neglected it. That means you've just let it cry. You've just, you've just ignored it and let it cry for hours. Yeah. You volunteering, Claire? Great. 
All ready to go. The schoolgirl volunteers must now test their ability to get through a night constantly interrupted by the cries of their electronic babies. If they're not put off the idea of breeding altogether, they may at least postpone it until they're better equipped to cope with the complexities of urban society. You could describe these dolls as a kind of computerised contraceptive. Of course, modern anti-breeding devices in the shape of contraceptive pills or condoms have given many women a much greater freedom of choice concerning their major priorities. In the Western world today, at least 70% of married women use some form of contraception. The almost universal availability of contraception has almost certainly been the most important development in women's lives during the 20th century. Millions have been liberated from being non-stop baby machines and are now able to plan their families to fit in with other aspects of their lives. And with the ever-expanding world population, this is a major step forward, not only for women, but for the whole human species. Clearly, none of these solutions is perfect. Mothers need to devote themselves to their babies, and intelligent women need to express themselves. So what can be done? The answer, it seems to me, is to be found in the longer lifespan of modern women, and in their ability to control the size of their families. There are two versions, breed young, rear two children, and then devote the rest of your life to a career. Or devote yourself single-mindedly to a career when young, and then breed late just before it starts to become dangerous. Yeah, you, can you do it on your own now? These young girls are going for the second option, like? to have an exciting career and then to have children. They're auditioning to join an all-female British pop group who are looking for a fifth member. Two male managers watch their every move. The girls must be physically fit to perform complex dance routines, and their youthful looks are also crucial to the group's success. OK, so seriously, once again, it's, it's um, pretty much even Stevens and all that stuff, because you're too lovely to wipe out. But it's just those three people, if you could remain, which is um, Catherine, Vanessa and Anna Maria. When they come to make their final decision, the managers will have to make sure that hopeful new members are prepared to put all thoughts of having children on hold. If, if you did stay, you did, we did go with the group and you, you, didn't, you didn't go back to college next year, would you be able to repeat and go back to your course? Yeah. So it wouldn't be, I mean, if you, if you could go back to it, it would well, it, like, Say if I pass these, these exams, yeah. then I've done like two years and you can defer for a year. You do realise that um, if you, you are committed to the group then, there's no sort of settling down with your boyfriends and sort of planning family. How do you feel about that? It's not really an issue for me until I'm about 35, I think. That's the age of babies for you. Yeah. <laughs> it, well, if then. I mean, I'm not really, <laughs> really into babies, actually. I'll push it to 50. You know what you mean? Yeah. What are you doing at the minute? I'm working at a bar in town called Lloyd's. Right, um, so, and you're 22, aren't you? Yeah. So, are you really surely you're going to be stage? sort of coming to the stage where you want to settle down and maybe have babies or... But you do realise that's... Obviously, yeah, yeah it's, not, it's not really my ambition in life, really. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's, yeah. Yeah, that's it on the yeah. questions, then? Yes, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Okay, thanks, ma'am. Thank oh, so who do you think it should be, then? I mean, Vanessa. Uh, Vanessa. Yeah. Vanessa. Yeah. She is pretty that. Yeah, yeah. I'm happy with that, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Hello again. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Right. Vanessa, again, you're the one that we've chosen, so... Welcome no, to the group. <laughs> 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 Ladies and gentlemen, from Nottingham, the one and only Sugar! It's Vanessa in the
For many women, the modern maternal dilemma will never be solved. The urban environment makes it incredibly difficult. As a result, there'll always be a risk of frustration and conflict within the family unit. The unfair way in which urbanization has treated the human female has certainly made its own special contribution to the ongoing war between the sexes. Instead of the tender intimacies we should find inside a close family relationship, what we all too often encounter is a competitive battle of wills. Finding a peaceful solution to this problem remains a major challenge for the future. <laughs>